Okay, so uh, this is going to be the last lecture of the quarter. Um, on Thursday, I'll be here just for helping you finish stuff. Uh, uh, and I wanted to wrap up with, we've been in the weeds pretty good all quarter long. Uh, I wanted to take a step up and give you a little bit of a broader view of what's happening security-wise. Uh, and so I'm going to step up to, into what they call attack frameworks, uh, trying to look at adversarial behavior uh, at, a, at a higher level. Um, so some motivation. Uh, if you are a, uh, so there is a term CISO, this is the chief security officer at, a, at an organization. So if you're a CISO, or if you're an IT manager, um, it can be really hard to identify what to work on and how to protect, you know, what to secure and how to secure it. Um, because there's so much there to do. Like, how do you prioritize all of that? And I bring back the Equifax $1 billion problem. They are forced to spend a billion dollars. So if you have a billion dollars, what are you going to spend that thing on? Like, what is the CISO of Equifax going to do with that money? Uh, patching? Better patching? Probably. <laughs> uh, maybe you buy you know, penetration testing. You know, maybe you do some training, phishing training of your employees. Uh, maybe you do so data exfiltration. Their system obviously was broken. So maybe you invest in better data, uh, data loss prevention uh, technology. Uh, or some other fancy shiny box that, that some vendor, like vendors are lining up trying to sell them this doohickey thing that, that will help them prevent the next breach. So how do they figure out, well, should I buy that product or not? Uh, and this is what this, this uh, lecture is about. Um, and so the answers actually come from the enemy. Uh, here's a quote from a book, a very famous book that I'm actually reading. It's, it's a, a book, I'm in a book club. And this just happened to be the book that we're reading in our book club. Where does this quote come from? Does anybody know? Uh, the, the big one is, is the bottom one. That's the one we really need. If you know, that is, yeah, so this is Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Uh, if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you're going to succumb in, in every battle. And this is pretty much how we're operating right now because it's often the case that you have no idea what you're running. Your organization, like developers are popping stuff up and down all the time. You have no idea what inventory you have. You also have no idea what like Russia's doing. Like, I have no idea, like, well, what are they sending at me? You know, how are they targeting me? What is their methodology? So right now we're losing every single time because of this. And so the goal is to get to the, uh, the top, right? The first one, if we know the enemy, we know what they're doing, and we know what we have, we know ourselves, and we, we have a prayer uh, at solving this problem. Okay, so uh, the first hack at this was this, well, the, the thing that really kicked off this approach was the cyber kill chain. Uh, this is from Lockheed Martin in about 2011. I linked the paper here. Um, I'm thinking of covering this in next quarter, and for any grad students here, I'm teaching this grad course, and I'm thinking of uh, doing, doing this uh, next quarter. Uh, this is the cyber kill chain, and it's the cyber equivalent to a military kill chain. Like, if you can figure out all the things that the adversary needs for a successful campaign, and you can basically take one of those steps out, then you can ensure failure on the adversary. So the same idea, but in the cyber realm. You have an idea of what the adversary needs to do to get to the objective. You try and, like, take out one of the steps uh, and, and really uh, uh, knock it out. OK, so here is a high level view of a cyber kill chain or a chain. And so you know it starts here, external reconnaissance, compromised machine, internal reconnaissance, local privilege escalation. Maybe you're executing some code. You're trying to get admin credentials in this lower privilege loop, the yellow loop. And then eventually, you score some admin credentials. And then you do basically the same thing at higher privilege levels. And then you own the infrastructure. <laughs> and then when you own the infrastructure, you can, do, you can carry out your objective, which is like, you know, send out all of the credentials for what, what, however many credentials Equifax lost. OK, so that's the idea. And then the kill chain is, oh, you know, maybe if I really lock that thing down, <laughs> then they can't, get, they can't get to the other side. Or maybe uh, if. <laughs> 
so the beginning of the quarter, maybe if all of my uh, stuff is patched, yeah, you sort of want to stop it up here if you can. Like, yeah, if everything was patched, then you don't have that compromised machine, and then the kill chain is broken. Okay. Uh, so the idea is to attack the attacker's playbook. So uh, this is a famous series of books, the hacker playbook. Uh, it's written by a really good penetration tester, and he basically just exposes all of the things that he does. And so obviously the thing is going to change because defenses change all the time, but he has a playbook. He just runs right through that playbook to see if he can get access to what he needs on his target, his or her target. And every single, so the CIA has a playbook, the NSA's got a playbook, the Russians have a playbook. They're all following uh, a certain set of, because they've all developed certain infrastructure that works for them. And so you can't just sit there and, you know, develop like on the fly new tools. You basically have a set of tools that work and then you follow the playbook for using those tools to get your objective. Now lately, Cyber Command has been, so they're on the outs with Iran. So Cyber Command lately has been just dumping all the tools from the Iranian uh, APT crews to basically disrupt their playbook, right? Like if I can just publicize that these tools are being used for, for everyone to see, so they're actually publishing it on VirusTotal. And so like, like every month, they're just publishing more Iranian APT software, and then immediately that kills their, that, that impacts their playbook and impa impacts their kill chain. So that's the idea of all this. Um, I used to have a copy of the hacker playbook. There's like, version, it's up to version three now. Um, and some of the tools that you're using uh, this week some of those tools are, are part of the playbook, uh, any playbook. Okay, here's an alternate chain. Uh, so it doesn't have the loops in it, but it's, it's similar in, in nature, reconnaissance, weaponization, and delivery. Uh, so this is done outside of the organization first to develop all of this stuff. And then finally, you exploit the organization, and then you, you once you're inside, you do the installation, the command and control, and then the actions on objectives. Uh, what's interesting about this uh, sort of uh, formulation is, is uh, you can see that the attack, it, the attacker is going to go from left to right, but when you are a victim of an attack, typically what you do is you go from right to left, right? You start with what the heck happened, like I did last week. I said, what the hell happened? 300 VMs is what happened, and I'm like, oh God, I have to work backwards, and then I figured out, oh, it's that dang the, what was the name of that shepherd credential that got me all the way to the left? So that's just an idea, uh, an idea of, 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 of what you would do with this chain. Okay, so that leads us, there were iterations on that cyber kill chain, uh, but the MITRE attack framework is really trying to generalize the whole approach um, and to really enumerate everything that could go on in, in the chain of uh, events. So uh, the MITRE attack framework is a common body of knowledge of known attacker behavior. So this is, they call them TTPs, tactics, tactics, techniques, and procedures of adversaries. And this is derived, this came out of the incidents response and threat intelligence communities. Uh, and they're basically looking at exactly what the attackers are using. Every single tool, what does, what does it actually do functionally? And I'm gonna enumerate everything that I've seen. And this is gonna be a crowdsource thing because everyone has seen different, different stuff. So I'm just gonna exhaustively enumerate everything that I have seen an attacker do, okay? And it's really focused on the last parts of the kill chain. So more, more on the installation, con command and control, and the act actions on ob objectives. It like expands out all of the things in the last parts of this. Okay, so uh, what are tactics? Tactics are overall beha behaviors, so general things that a, a, an attacker wants to do. Uh, techniques are the specific instantiations of a tactic. Uh, so how do you uh, leverage that uh, in, in operation? And then procedures are collections of techniques. So this is the playbook. Uh, so an adversary is gonna use a whole bunch of different toolings to get to the final objective. So that's what the, the TTP stands for, and this is an acronym that's thrown around everywhere. Uh, so that's, before I use it a lot, I'm gonna throw that out there. 
Um, and so the, the best way to view the MITRE ATT&CK framework is through uh, its matrix. So this is it in, in kind of its glory. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really fuzzy because this is, this is the best illustration of it that I, that I could find. Um, and it's scraped off of this video from CSO, CISO perspective. Um, and if you look at this matrix, at the top are your 12 tactics. These are the general things that the adversary wants to do. In the columns underneath the tactics are the specific techniques that meet that object, that, that, that implement that tactic. And then in the green, this is sort of the chain. These are the individual kill chains that are going on where you're basically, you know, initial access to execution and the execution could follow different paths through the matrix. And then this is your, your basic, your, the adversary's playbook throughout your infrastructure to get to the final objective, which is all the way on the right. Okay. Um, questions? Is that pretty, pretty straightforward? Okay, so these are the 12 tactics. Um, and yes, I'm going to go through all 12, but hopefully not, hopefully not too, not in too much detail. I know it's, it's kind of hard to go through a laundry list of things. Um, so in order to make this semi-interesting, I am going to try and talk about the 12 tactics in the context of what you've seen in class. And in fact, both the Cloud Goat exercises and Thunder CTF exercises were meant to emulate uh, one of these playbooks, right? Like, so you're basically doing multiple steps in this attack framework in one campaign. And that was the idea of these, of these uh, levels, is to try and give you a better simulation rather than like your homework site, which is like one exploit, one exploit, one exploit. There's no objective uh, at all. And so this is, this is where we were going. So that's why a lot of the examples that I'm gonna talk about relate back to the, the AWS, the Cloud Goat stuff and, the, and the, um, the Thunder stuff. Okay, so the first thing is initial access. This is where the attacker gets a foothold uh, in your environment, the starting point. And so all quarter long, we've been doing this. We have a vulnerable public facing web application. It's got like a SQL injection. It's got a command injection. That's your entry point. Okay, so that's been the, like the first half of this course. Uh, also, some other things that uh, an adversary could do is spear phishing. So sending you an attachment that you click on, that would be another way to get access to a machine in the enterprise. Uh, or uh, maybe the adversary has got your uh, account credentials. So that's another thing. So uh, what are the detections and mitigations against this? Uh, the attacker could basically, or the defender could basically be looking at the access logs uh, and the login uh, sort of data to figure out whether or not um, some malicious uh, activity is going on. Could, uh, the, the defender could scan attachments. Uh, some other mitigations, patching. All the vulnerabilities as soon as they come up would be one thing, making sure your patching infrastructure is, is working. Uh, proxy filters, so we talked about web application firewalls that can filter out the simple attack strings uh, that someone might be sending your way. Uh, browser protections, so especially for phishing sites or malware sites, a lot of browsers, if they have noticed that the site has been delivering malware, they'll actually give you something in the browser, in the UI that tells you that this is happening. Um, and then two-factor authentication, uh, especially for the login. Like if they've got your credentials, but they don't have your, your second factor, then that will prevent the initial access. Um, the next thing is actually executing something in the target environment. Uh, so the classic example of this is getting a shell uh, on the target environment. So you've seen this uh, multiple ways. So the command injection uh, through serverless goat, uh, where you're able to basically do a print env <laughs> to get the AWS keys. So that's, that's execution of code. The deserialization labs, so the Node.js uh, deserialization lab where you're actually sending in JavaScript that, that gets executed and, and, and sent back. Um, and then uh, the web for pen tester and the port swigger command injection uh, levels are examples of this. Uh, the other thing is the user, if they've clicked on that spear phishing attachment, will obviously execute that payload directly. So what are the countermeasures of that? Um, the first is detection, so monitoring all the processes. So some of these, so in um, in the malware class, so the malware class is going to be offered in the summer 
uh, as a flipped course. So the malware class, there's this thing called procmon, which is a process monitor. Um, this is something that you could basically run to keep an audit of what's running on your system to detect any rogue execution of programs uh, that you may have downloaded. Um, <clears throat> sandbox execution, where you're trying to run all of these things that you've downloaded in a sandbox so that if it is malicious, it doesn't get out and, and do damage. Um, so sandbox execution is big for HR departments. Right, because they're for like their, their job is to click on attachments, basically. <laughs> like, yeah, see your resume, click on the resume. See your res so they're basically uh, so a sandbox would would be, would help keep all that stuff uh, from from jailbreaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be yeah. Uh, that might be actually uh, maybe Google would do that if you uh, sent their HR department something that would get you access. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, <laughs> It's a good thought. <laughs> I think it would just get you uh, in trouble with the police, uh, to be honest. <laughs> um, there's also, uh, we also do a little bit of, uh, uh, so I skipped this part. Uh, you can get uh, uh, code execution with buffer overflow. So if you're running a vulnerable uh, binary, uh, this is what we like to do when, like it's CS201, you know, get get uh, buffer overflow attacks, although these are, these are becoming rarer, uh, the buffer overflow attacks. Um, so some mitigations, uh, whitelisted software execution. So uh, not allowing uh, arbitrary code to be run on a machine. Uh, uh, data execution prevention, so there are CPU protections against code execution that is a result of buffer overflows. So you'd wanna turn that on, on your system, on, across the enterprise. Uh, there are, in terms of uh, change root jails and containers, these are kind of like sandboxes, so that if you break out of the interpreter, you're not going to do any damage to the underlying operating system. You're basically going to, you know, you, you'll break out of the container. And if you uh, remember the, uh, the Node.js deserialization lab, where you go on to repl it, and you, you basically break out of that, you, you, because you do the deserialization to get into the underlying container, they do that because it's in a container, right? Like when you break out of there, you're not getting at Repolit's uh, underlying sort of machines. And so that's the idea, right? You can, as long as you have isolated the thing properly in a sandbox, then you don't mind having that, that execution happening. Uh, persistence. So this is any change to that system, that compromise system to maintain your access over time. Um, and most of these examples are things that you will see in the malware class if you take it. So registry run keys, startup folders. So every operating system goes through a, a startup sequence where you automatically start particular programs, system programs. So you can just, as an adversary, you can just place yourself in that startup script uh, to get, to get at, persistent access to that machine. Um, you can actually replace any of the binaries and the libraries on that system so that when someone types in ls, it's doing more than just ls. Uh, and then you can install yourself in the browser. So malicious browser extensions, for example, uh, could be installed. Uh, so uh, the way you would detect and mitigate this detection, it's basically you're, you're doing file and registry integrity tools. Uh, and then for mitigations, uh, you would want to execute at least privileges. You don't want to let any program to be able to stick something in a startup folder or to modify a registry key that says execute me on startup. So those are the things that you would want to lock down there. And then uh, lately, a lot of operating systems will only uh, execute code that is signed, that is digitally signed with a certificate that they trust. And then you would get a big warning as a user if you're trying to execute something that's not digitally signed. So that will also prevent you from persisting something that you don't want to persist. Okay, uh, the next one is privilege escalation. So uh, obtaining elevated or administrator <laughs> access on a machine, network, or domain. Uh, so the examples, there's a heck of a lot of these in the cloud uh, CTFs that you were doing. And in fact, uh, Thursday was all about getting this uh, elevated, uh, uh, mis uh, so elevated privileges from misconfigured IAM policies is the classic example that uh, 
that, that happened here last week. And then vulnerable set UID programs, if you have any flaw in a program that can elevate its privileges to be root temporarily. So when you change your password, for example, on a Linux machine, that in order to change that your password, you have to run as root. And so, because and, you're changing a system file that only root can modify. And so that binary takes on the role of administrator, but if it has a flaw that allows you to inject code into the execution of the binary, then you can get root access uh, directly. So that's the idea. Um, so to detect this uh, audit logging, so when we, um, when we went and, and, and looked in the privilege escalation through uh, my cloud project, you could see where the credentials came from. Uh, there are also sudo logs, so if you, um, if you have multiple administrators on a particular machine and you know something bad has happened on that machine, you can go through these sudo logs because in order to get root access, you typically run all the commands through sudo if you're good. You, you would never allow just straight up root access, but like you would use sudo logs to, to, to track that activity. Uh, so some mitigations for privilege escalation. Um, application and white, machine whitelisting, so you only allow particular endpoints to ga gain root privileges, not just anybody can, can get, get those accesses. So for example, that credential, that uh, the shepherd credential, if I could have bound that shepherd credential to a particular IP address within Portland State, then I could have, they don't, I don't think they have this in the IAM policies, but if I did bind that credential to Portland State addresses, that person in Bulgaria or wherever that person was wouldn't have been able to launch all those uh, virtual machines. Um, hardening endpoints, so Linux has got this seccomp thing, so if, uh, say you have a web server and your web server is vulnerable, if somebody gets command injection on your web server, they can access all the parts of the operating system. So seccomp says, hey, you know, I have this server, but all it needs is these three system calls. So what seccomp does is it allows you to say, you know what, all the other system calls, all the other 200 plus system calls, deny those to this, this server. Only give it the three system calls I want. And in fact, don't give it exec. So exec is a system call that, that executes arbitrary uh, code. Like, it doesn't need that. It's serving files. It should never need the ability to spawn a new process. That's what Linux seccomp does. It just locks all that down so that it can only do one or two things. And the one or two things that the server was written to do. Um, so that's what, uh, what that effort is about. Um, and then finally, isolation. So containers, so that if someone elevates privileges, there's not much they can do with it. Because there's nothing on that container that's, that's worth uh, getting at. Uh, defense evasion. So this is avoiding detection or other countermeasures. Uh, so the examples of this are all of the polymorphism and obfuscation techniques that you were using to bypass the cross-site scripting filters, uh, to bypass the command injection uh, filtering with the semicolons and, and those sorts of things. If you have that as your defensive measure, uh, then the evasion technique is to try and subvert that using encoding, different kinds of encoding uh, and different characters other than what the filters are, are doing. Um, another thing uh, that you would do is you would install rootkits. Uh, you would delay your execution, so for antivirus. And I, these are techniques that are covered in the malware class. Uh, for the 600 second bypass, most antivirus has a timeout saying that, hey, I'm gonna look at this malware snippet, but if it doesn't do anything after um, 10 minutes, I'm just gonna allow it through. So then the malware is just like, oh, I'll just sleep 10 minutes and then, and then deliver my, my, my payload. So that's what that is. Uh, a lot of malware will disable all of your security controls. So your code signing facility, your antivirus processes, it will kill your software updates so that you can't uh, uh, download any uh, countermeasures uh, from then on. Um, another way to evade defenses is if I am actually monitoring my network for uh, things like command and control or data exfiltration, like bad behavior on my network, uh, one of the things that adversaries have done is to take their traffic and put it over web and DNS to make it look like legitimate traffic. So if you can copy legitimate traffic, you can sort of hide under the radar uh, in what looks to be uh, reasonable 
uh, activity. Uh, and then the last one is tampering with log files. If you had access to the log files on a system, this was what Kevin Mitnick did. You would delete your, your login entries, and then you wouldn't be able to uh, uh, detect that an attack had happened. Okay, so what are some mitigations for this? Um, monitoring the defenses to ensure that they're running. Um, and I don't know if you remember this, but uh, the Equifax breach, one of the things that happened, they had this tool that was monitoring for data exfiltration, but its uh, TLS certificate expired, and so it silently failed. And it was not running for five months preceding the actual uh, breach, the exploit. And so that's, you have to actually make sure when you deploy a technology for, for a security technology that it actually is working, and they didn't do that. Uh, so, so, and, and that was the example uh, I wanted to use there. Uh, monitoring any endpoint changes. So if any person installs anything to their end system in the enterprise, you should be able to identify what that is. Uh, uh, and then sending the audit logs. So this is for the, the tampering with the log files. Sending those audit logs to a central location uh, that is like append only so that you can't uh, tamper with those logs. And that was also the thing that uh, got Kevin Mitnick because those, those logs were, were sent to a remote machine after every login. Uh, the sixth one, credential access. Uh, gaining control over the authentication information of a user, system, domain, or service. Uh, so we've seen a ton of this in the last week or two with the flaws.cloud, with the Thunder CTF, uh, the access keys uh, in all of those things, whenever they're exposed, they can be accessed. Uh, you can also get credential access by doing a brute force credential attack. So uh, your lab, your Hydra lab, for example, uh, you'll, be, you'll be doing that. Uh, credential dumping of clear, clear text passwords or, or password hashes uh, is another way of being able to get credentials. Uh, stolen session cookies. So if you are able to get the cookie file of a browser that, uh, of a person who you're trying to uh, hijack the, the session from, then you can impersonate that person for as long as that session cookie is valid. Uh, and then keyboard loggers uh, could be used to get usernames and passwords. Uh, so detection for this, uh, auditing access. So you have to be very careful. You have to actually look at how your credentials are being accessed, where they're being accessed from, and, uh, and how they're being accessed. And so this is very similar to what credit card companies are doing to detect fraud, right? You're, you're looking for anomalies in how credentials are being used, and then you're detecting malicious use of them uh, uh, online. Um, some other things that can mitigate uh, this attack is rate limiting authentication attempts. So I gave an example earlier, if you remember, of the Instagram 2FA process that wasn't being rate limited properly. So somebody launched a whole bunch of AWS uh, EC2 instances and got a whole bunch of different IP addresses and was able to brute force the 2FA code. I think it was a four digit code. So they only needed uh, 5,000 guesses apparently to, to be able to get to break the 2FA on someone's Instagram. Um, another mitigation is to use real password hashes, right? So bcrypt and scrypt, rather, things that do the stretching of the hashes rather than just uh, uh, MD5 or SHA uh, for your password hashing. Um, elimination of credential sharing. So this is an issue where if you have an admin account and they all share the same credential, you don't know when someone has gone rogue, right? And so this is where uh, having the sudo, log, like making everything go through sudo where it's an authenticated regular user first before it's an, uh, an admin user is really helpful. If you are just sharing the root login credentials, you don't have any of that telemetry of who start, like who is responsible for this particular root uh, access. Um, key rotation, so always rotating any of these keys especially if you're running vulnerable cloud services like Cloud Goat, making sure that those keys don't stay, uh, stay around. In fact, this is what, um, I don't know if you saw that email that I forwarded from AWS, but they're like, you need to make sure you, you, you invalidate every single key from before this thing happened. And so I had to actually manually delete. I had like three or four keys that were issued beforehand. They're like, no, just assume they're all compromised. So this key rotation, is really painful if you have to do it manually. 
And this is why a lot of cloud services have automatic key management services that you can configure to do the rotation. Uh, I did mine manually, just because I only had like three or four. Um, uh, the other uh, thing that will thwart uh, um, this, this uh, issue would be 2FA, right? Like just having the credential uh, doesn't necessarily get you access. You need that second factor, so that, that will shut a lot of things down. And then password managers and strong password policies as well. So this is for stuff like preventing the brute force attacks on, uh, on your user's passwords. Um, and typically, you're allowed to set the password policy for your organization. On AWS, when you have your, so I, uh, I have the root account for AWS, and then I have these IAM users uh, that I configure. You can actually set the password policy on those IAM users, uh, and you can make, make, you can force them into a certain length and certain characters. You can specify a rotation policy on the, on the passwords as well. So that's what this, this is about. Okay, uh, the next one is discovery. So gaining knowledge about the target environment, such as its software, its networks, its users, and its processes. Uh, so some examples. Uh, the, the best example, I think, is the Thunder CTF A6 container level, where you're noodling around and you say, hey, look, there's a container image being run on this particular machine. And then, hey, look, I can actually download that image and see what's in it. And then when you see the image layer, you say, hey, look, there's a, there's a route there that's got special access to this, that, or the other. That's the discovery process, right? When you're getting dropped into a cloud environment, you're doing things like, oh, what permissions does this credential have? Uh, can it list Lambda functions, which it can, or can it uh, list EC2 uh, instances? So that's all the discovery phase, enumerating what's running uh, on the back end. Um, and so it could be more than just over the network. It would be the accounts on the machine, the files, the directories on that machine, uh, the security software that's being run, right? Like this is one of the more important ones because this, before you do anything, you have to know uh, what the detection, the, the detection software is doing. Because you don't want to, you don't want to set off the alarms, right? You want to be in their stealth. Uh, stealth mode, so you're going to look for artifacts that say certain security software is running uh, on the back end. Um, the other thing you would do is do network reconnaissance. Uh, and typically what you would want to do is first do this passive network sniffing because uh, it may be the case that the, uh, when you're on the back end that the people running the back end are looking for scans. Like, if there's any scanning behavior on your back end, you should flag that as an admin because nobody should be doing discovery <laughs> on your back end. It's usually an adversary. And so what you would do, because this is so noisy, you, would, you, you might look to see, hey, can I find some log files that have IP addresses of servers that this machine is communicating with? And then I won't need to probe the network for services that are up that I can attack uh, later. Okay, um, so detection, uh, monitoring the histories. Uh, so in the bash history, keeps track of all your, your prior commands. Uh, in Windows, there's a recent directory that lists all the files that you have recently accessed. Um, in the cloud, if you remember, um, when I looked in the cloud trail, I could see the discovery uh, commands that the adversary was using. Do you, do you remember what that was? It was that list service quotas. So that the adversary was basically trying to figure out what was available to him or her to, to run. So like how much how much can I ask for is is basically that that part of the of the discovery process. Um, you can also if you're analyzing your your back end network traffic, so and uh, you can find you know, scans. Uh, one of the most effective things to do is to put a honeypot on the network that has no legitimate uh, reason to be accessed. And then an indiscriminate scan will immediately flag that that source has basically uh, got something going on uh, to it. Uh, some other mitigations, uh, canaries and, and honey tokens. So uh, the idea is that you wanna create a bunch of chaff so that when the adversary is sitting there trying to figure out what's legitimate and what's noise, has a hard time. So if you litter AWS access, uh, uh, access key IDs and secret access keys all over 
your file shares. And then in, throughout all your documents and, and litter usernames and passwords, uh, bogus ones, uh, and then wait for them to be used. As soon as they're used, you have a signal that says, okay, this, the adversary has gotten uh, into my network. Uh, traffic filtering, not allowing certain accesses on, on particular machines. So, for example, the HR machines should not be able to talk to the dev machines, right, at all. And this is what they call network segmentation. Segment your network so that you can isolate the traffic uh, between them. So you can shut down all of, so if, if the HR machine does get compromised, all that it has access to is the other HR machines. Um, uh, the next one's lateral movement. So pivoting from uh, one machine to another. Uh, so uh, what you will be doing is things like uh, exploiting remote services. Uh, once you get a foothold, you want to find a, another service that you can you can move to that's got a stronger foothold, that's got more privileges. So that's typically lateral movement. If we were still running Cloud Goat, the good example of that is RCE Web App. But um, that, I guess, um, what happened there was you first have access to an EC2 instance, and then you figure out credentials to a database instance that you can actually get back into. So then, and then the database instance has the things that you were looking for. So that's an idea. That that's an example of of lateral movement in the backend infrastructure. There's probably a couple of examples of that in Thunder, but offhand. Actually, no, there might not be. It was, you're pivoting from a Lambda over to an EC2 in, in Thunder. So, so Thunder is a lot of serverless stuff. So lateral, what does lateral movement mean when you're doing serverless? Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, Another interesting one is shared drives. This is one of the things that they'll look for. It's like, hey, if I have a compromised machine, if I can stick my malware in a drive that's shared across the organization, then I can get everybody infected, right? And I don't even actually have to scan the network for my, uh, my victims. They'll just come to me. It's like a watering hole attack. If you can find a shared drive that everyone's accessing and you plop in your whatever your malicious uh, payload is and you can trick someone into executing it, uh, that's, uh, that's one technique. Um, SSH hijacking. So I mentioned um, there was a cloud provider that had by default turned on SSH forwarding and was using their SSH root access uh, with the forwarding turned on. And then all you needed to do is hijack the, uh, that connection to basically SSH into anybody's uh, virtual machine. That's definitely lateral movement. Like you can get to anybody's machine from this, this one uh, endpoint. Uh, that's why I stuck that in there. Um, so detection, uh, traffic analytics, uh, and then auditing for, for uh, anomalies. Uh, another kind of mitigation is tar pits and honeypots. So um, in the cloud class, I mentioned this product that Galois, which is just down the street, uh, has, has developed. It's called CyberChaff. And the idea is to try and bring up thousands of these micro virtual machines, they're unikernel machines, thousands of those on one machine, and make it look like you've got a whole bunch of servers when you only have one. This is to basically tar pit the adversary, because now the adversary sees all of these presences on the network and has a, has a harder time figuring out which ones to attack, uh, uh, legitimately attack. Uh, and then also network segmentation, as we mentioned earlier. Um, will prevent lateral movement. Okay, the, uh, the next one is collection. So gathering the information that you need for your uh, uh, prior to exfiltration. So examples of this, I guess the only example that I could come up with is the credit card information in A2 Finance, that you're basically gonna collect as much of that information all in one place and then hopefully exfiltrate that uh, as your next step. Uh, there are examples of in Metasploit, you can do uh, screen grabs of the remote machine, which I think is funny because you like, oh, like underneath, you launch the Metasploit module and then you can see the, the user's uh, uh, desktop uh, remotely. So uh, that's one of the th modules in, in Metasploit. Uh, keyboard loggers, so capturing the credentials from the keyboard. Uh, webcam captures, so, um, this is how we outed, uh, so Fancy Bear 
this is the Russian APT crew that like um, they're they're responsible for some of the the election hacking, and so what happened? They basically compromised the U.S. State Department, and the Dutch, while this was happening, figured out the source of where that attack was coming from, hacked into the web cameras of the attacker, and then had a video feed of the attacker as they were typing in the commands that were showing up on the other side on the uh, Department of State. So there was a, I have, an art, I have a link to an article about this. They have, they have basically in real time the ability to do the attribution that this was a Russian operation that, that compromised the State Department. I think it was like 2017 or 2016 uh, that this happened. Okay, um, detection. Um, basically, you would need to do a detailed inventory of all your sensitive data. This is what a lot of people don't have um, in the enterprise. There is so much data, and you have to figure out all of the data to protect. And so this, this operate, there are, there are full-on companies that all they do is inventory uh, uh, rundowns of your, of your backend. Uh, so you need a detailed inventory, and you want to make sure that you're logging all the accesses to that data so that you can you can check. Yes. Yeah, so encryption encryption of information at rest and in transit so that, yes, if that database, uh, if the credentials of the database are exposed, at least the keys that have encrypted the entries in there might not be exposed. So uh, an encrypted database might be uh, something you could do. Um, and then least privilege. So uh, making sure that the access to the sensitive data, if you're in the cloud at least, is done with roles that are, that are provisioned properly. Uh, the next one is command and control. So this is communicating back. Phoning home is basically command and control. The adversary needs to be able to, from the target environment, talk to an external uh, uh, control. Um, so this is uh, typically a, a set of addresses, uh, URLs, or DNS names that you, you get the implant, whatever's running on the target, to, call, to phone back. Uh, to the adversary. Uh, the only example of this, the only example of this in the labs that I could find were uh, port swigger. So I think in the blind command injection, you do a DNS lookup, and then if you own that domain, you can get the query out of, so that they restrict, they restrict one part of the command injection. That's one of these levels. Do you, do you remember this? Did I assign this level? Where there's a DNS, okay, okay so then that, that's the only one I could, but you could, you could basically use DNS to signal, and I think uh, Ethan had sent something about DNS payloads, like uh, attaching payloads into the text part of the DNS record. Uh, that's another way you can exfiltrate on the, on the sly. Um, okay, so some detection firewalls on both uh, or filtering on both incoming and outgoing connections. So this is what uh, things like uh, data loss prevention pieces of software do. You, what you're going to do is you're going to have to terminate every in, uh, encrypted connection, decrypt it, and figure out exactly what's going on back and forth uh, in order to make sure that the command and control and the data exfiltration is not happening on your enterprise. So that's what these uh, so the security vendors will, will implement these solutions where you're doing deep, they call it deep packet inspection, where you're actually having to terminate the encrypted connection and, and, and monitor it for, for things. Um, connection logging in, in uh, these backend seams, so ELK and Splunk and Cloud Audit logs are examples of backend things that you can query all the connections uh, that, and, and, and do some querying to see if there's command and control destinations that are being accessed. Uh, and then the mitigation again, uh, network segmentation is another um, thing that you uh, can do to deploy this. So I put this example here. Uh, they, this is specifically on the target breach. So with the target breach, the adversary was able to uh, get on all the points of sales machines. And then from these, uh, the adversary was able to get out into the internet <laughs> to do the exfiltration. And so if this thing had been segmented properly where the point of sale machines could only connect to one address, like the back end target uh, processor, then you wouldn't have had 
uh, as big of a, a problem on that, on that particular end. Okay, exfiltration, transferring all the sensitive, sensitive information out of the target. Uh, the only example, that, the only good example I could come up with here is that disk snapshot in level four, where it's like they didn't realize it was public, so you get into their AWS project and you just copy it uh, right out. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of on the sly web and DNS exfiltration, so uh, basically steganography uh, and mimicry attacks in order to make sure you are uh, able to get data out of there without being detected. Uh, for insider threats, uh, it's often the case that if you have a rogue insider that the USB drive uh, will be used to get the data out. So this is Edward Snowden. <laughs> That's what I think he had a, I've not, maybe not USB. He had a, he had a drive and he walked it right out. He did this web scraping of all of the NSA sites and he got a disk and he, and he went out and flew to Hong Kong, I think is his, that's what the, his, that's his first stop. And then now he's in, now he's in Russia. Now he's in, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, detection, uh, data loss prevention tools. Actually, that's both detection and mitigation. Uh, looking at the device usage history, especially for the USB drives, seeing what's been plugged in. Um, and then some mitigations, encryption at rest, <laughs> so that uh, the adversary can't decrypt what's, what they uh, access. Uh, and then a lot of companies have done this. Yeah, don't allow USB. So like if you go to like um, any of the defense agencies, it's like, yeah, there's no USB uh, allowed in any of those. <laughs> <laughs> any of those places. And in fact, I think in Intel also. Almost immediately after Snowden, we were allowed to use okay. any USB device. And where were you at when that uh, happened? I was in the Coast Guard. Oh, Coast Guard. Okay, and then they just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, the last one, finally. Uh, impact. So, this is the, this is sort of meeting your, your, or getting your objectives. Uh, so, uh, this is actually similar to exfiltration, it's the end goal. Uh, and so with exfiltration, you're, you're basically, so there's this CIA properties for security. There's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so that's what the CIA properties are. And so exfiltration targets confidentiality. And then everything else is under impact to, to basically impact integrity and availability. Um, so some examples of this. Uh, the one that I could think of from Thunder is A5 Power. Uh, where you're replacing the function code. Now, if you think about that, if the adversary was, I think you can get the function code as well. What you could do is you could get the function code, you could put your backdoor in there, and then you could upload that and keep that function code operational. And so that is an attack on integrity where you're able to get the access uh, by compromising the integrity of the original one uh, on the slide. So, um, the most famous, the thing that's being done left, right, and center right now is ransomware, where you would just uh, encrypt uh, all the data. So in terms of a detection, uh, an integrity check, and then backups would be the things uh, that people are working on. Okay, so that is a lot. And trust, there's, a, there's a reason why I, I've gone through this. Um, you see those 12 tactics? Those are the tactics that are driving the defense. And a lot of companies are, are going after these, this enumeration to buy their products. Uh, so this, this is what they call threat-informed defensive strategy. Uh, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna invest in things that will allow you to knock out some of these tactics. Uh, there are two ways to do this. One of the things that you do almost immediately is to model the threats that you're trying to address. You can't, you can't prevent every threat. So there are two ways that you can do, well, there's multiple ways, but there's two uh, broad ways that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, you could go all the way to the right and you could start at the impact. You say, this is the impact that is death to me. I wanna focus on that, like ransomware. I wanna make sure I am not a victim of ransomware. And so what you would do, is you'd work backwards from impact <laughs> through the tactics, through the chain, to make sure there is no way to get from the left all the way to the right. Um, so one of those chains have to be broken, and then you can say, I've protected myself against ransomware. Um, if it's data exfiltration, 
then I have a different set of controls that I need to apply to make sure that that chain is no longer there. Uh, the other way of doing this is to start on the left. Start with the TTPs of the attackers. So like, um, say I know who's out. Oregon State is out to get me. <laughs> and I know they're out to get my, um, my AWS account. Like, and then I could say, well, what is the OSU playbook? Maybe I'll go to their classes and see what their security classes are teaching. See, these OSU students are really good at crypto. And their playbook is to break all, all the crypto from left to right. We, just, we sent our CTF team down there uh, two weekends ago. And it was like, whoa, there's a lot of crypto stuff down here. Way more crypto than, 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 than any of us can teach them. Uh, so then you would be like, oh, I, I know who wants to get me. I'm just going to look at that person's playbook and go from left to right. <laughs> I'm going to start with the techniques that they know to get initial access. And I'm going to go, uh, go that way. So do two different directions uh, would be what you would do. Um, and so this really is probably a better way for Equif Equifax to prioritize their $1 billion, right? Like if they want to make sure that data exfiltration doesn't happen, then they could go from, from right to left. Um, would be one way. Um, I don't know which way they're, they're, they're going. Uh, OK, so I'm going to go through a demo of how this thing is used. So because it's an election year, I figured, hey, why don't, why don't we uh, see about the election? Um, so say you wanted to protect our upcoming election from the methods of attack used in 2016. So in 2016, we had Cozy Bear, which was a uh, Russian foreign intelligence service. So this is sort of like our, um, um, this is like the CIA of, of Russia is what you could consider this. Uh, and then we had Fancy Bear, which was this military intelligence arm, which is more like our NSA. They were both after us. And so uh, uh, these are the folks that did basically the DNC breach, the Petya and not Petya, the Cozy Bear, and then Fancy Bear did the DNC breach, the French elections, and uh, they targeted the US conservative groups. In fact, one of the stories is that both Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear didn't know that they were targeting the DNC at the same time. So then they, when they ran into each other in the DNC, it, that's where they found out that they had both gotten in um, in the postmortem, which is kind of kind of sad. Um, but say also, so we want to protect, like, like if the same stuff happens in 2020 as in happened 2016, we didn't learn a thing. So, so this is just a start. And so these, these APTs, they're, they're developing new tricks. But you should definitely make sure the old tricks don't work anymore. And then maybe you can threat model the new tricks that they might have uh, started deploying. Um, but you also want to, we've made a lot of other enemies other than the Russians. So like the North Koreans want to get at us. The Iranians want to get at us. And these are their APT crews. So the Lazarus group, they sourced WannaCry. And then the, um, uh, I think this is the, the, kitten, the kitten group from Iran. Uh, they are actually going after, this is a recent thing, this is from last uh, October. They actually tried to attack Donald Trump's uh, political campaign. Uh, so they're going after, I guess they don't like John, Donald Trump, so they're like, okay, we're gonna, this is like payback time, so, so they're targeting them. So you have all of these APTs, and um, the people who are in the um, threat intelligence community, they have seen the tactics, right? They have seen the compromises. They have seen the tooling. They've got good audit information. And so what they do is they just enter it in. Let's enter this into the TTPs of the attack framework. Let's enumerate what these a uh, APTs are doing. And then uh, that is what this interface that I'm about to show you does. So what this uh, navigator does is that it takes the attack matrix. Across the top, you have your tactics. In the columns, you have your techniques, and then uh, you can select the procedures, and I'll show you this in a second. You say, hey, tell me what the uh, APT28 uh, playbook is, and then it'll light up some things, so I'll just do a demo. So if I recall, so for example, uh, let's call this layer APT. APT28, and I want to say, I, I, want to, I want to figure out what APT28 does. So I'm going to scroll down. 
I'll select this and it'll light up these things as, as being. These are the techniques that uh, the APT is uh, known for doing. And I'm gonna, as part of this matrix, I can give it a, a, a score, say, it's a priority score. So say this is my highest priority of uh, APT crew to, uh, to prevent uh, attacks from. So I can say, so I score from one to 100, let me say this thing is 50. And so the, the thing is color coded. So like really bad is green, and then I, I could care less is red. So let me just say this, uh, I'll make it 70. <laughs> no, I'll leave it at 50. So, so I'll, I'll leave that at 50. So that's, this, this lights up all of the, uh, the techniques and the tactics that this particular crew is using. And then say I also want to defend against APT28. So I'll create a new layer, or 29, sorry. So this is the other Russian one. And uh, you can select down here, APT29. They are also my enemy of equal stature. So I'll, I'll say 50 on that one too. And then I can create another one. The other one was uh, APT35, which was, I think that was APT35. And that's the Korean one. So this one is, I think, one of the kitten families. Give this copy kittens. And then say, um, say I don't have much respect for uh, for them, so I'm gonna say, um, give them a score of 10. I don't really care about the techniques that that, uh, that crew is using. And then the other one was 38. So this is the Iranian crew. APT 38. And then say, uh, I'll give them a little better score, maybe it's 40. And then what I can do is I say, hey, I want to aggregate. So I have some rankings of these, these actors. I have a modeling for their importance and the techniques that they're using. So maybe I can now, I'll create this uh, another layer and say, I want to do an aggregation of all of these layers to get an aggregate score. And then when I create this next layer, you can see color-coded all of these things overlaid on each other. And then if you see the stuff in green, these are the things that are higher priority for me to, to focus on as an organization. So then if I am trying to prevent against these four APTs, maybe I would start on the left with some spearfish, so, so two-factor authentication would be nice, and then I can get rid of that. And this is where you would prioritize your spend as an organization. So that's why this thing is taking off uh, uh, in, in the vendor community. Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I misinterpreted it. Maybe uh, 100 was innocuous, and then zero was, it's like golf. Wait, no, wait, no, that's the opposite. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah. Uh, you can set your colors the way you want. In fact, here, let me fix that then. See, I can, I can change my colors. I can change my colors if I want to. Oh, I'm not going to, but yeah, this, this nice UI. Um, so that's, a, that's the framework, and this is how you would apply it uh, as an organization. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now what? So you have all these things prioritized. Now the, the thing you would want to do is you, you know that you're after spear phishing. Now you need a control to make sure that that thing is completely neutralized, that, that box in the matrix is neutralized. Um, and so typically you have controls to do any one of these things. Uh, detect, deny, disrupt, degrade, or deceive. So those are the typical, so you build a control that addresses one of those things, and then you would, you would want it to do one of these five uh, actions. And so uh, there is this organization, the Center for Internet Security Controls, 
uh, for internet security, they've come up with this controls enumeration. So it's just like an, just like the MITRE attack has an ontology for the different tactics and techniques. Uh, the Center for Internet Security has an ontology for the kinds of controls that you would then apply to that matrix. Uh, so this is the whole list of them. I am not going to go through all 20. Um, but this is, you know, one of these kinds of controls you would apply to, to the, that box. And it's pretty exhaustive. Uh, pretty much every countermeasure will fall under one of these 20 things. So just like you're, you're, you're basically doing the attack, the, the, the attack framework for the defender. All the defender tactics, and then you would enumerate all 20. Um, but an enumeration just tells you what the what sort of the goal of the control is. The enumeration doesn't really tell you how that implementation is going to work. Like when I buy something, when I buy that shiny box, how do I know it's going to do what it what it claims to do? Um, so as part of your controls. Uh, you would want to choose your control based on what they call a pyramid of pain. And this is not pain for us. This is pain on the adversary. So you want to look at a control and you say, where is it trying to attack the problem? Is it going to attack the problem at the bottom of the pyramid, and uh, which is for the attacker is trivial to bypass? Or are you going to get a control that works at the very top of the pyramid, which the attacker is like, crap, that sucks. Like when so like the, the, the uh, example here was like, as soon as you run into 2FA, the adversary is like, crap, that really sucks because that's a TTP that, that wipes out the entire box, right? Like 99.9%. Like .9%. This was an article that was just two days ago. Microsoft was like, yeah, 99% of all compromises uh, were accounts that didn't use 2FA. So this is the, this is the, um, this is the pyramid of pain. Uh, and so it's enumerated. Uh, based on the kind of con what the control is actually doing. Uh, so at the very bottom, uh, the thing that's easiest to bypass is filtering that's done on hash values. So this is antivirus signatures. If you have a signature scheme for detecting bad malware, well, as soon as I twiddle one bit of that piece of malware, I bypass your filter. So that's why this is called trivial, um, and that's why Antivirus signatures are going away. Uh, they're looking more at behavioral uh, signatures. Uh, another thing that's easy to bypass is IP addresses. Say I start filtering uh, particular bad IP addresses. Well, the adversary just gets another AWS EC2 instance with a different IP address and then, and then gets me there. So that's easy. Um, a little bit uh, less easy is DNS uh, blocking. So one of the things that the adversary will do when they're in your network uh, is try and rendezvous to an endpoint that they control. Now, they don't want to hard code an IP address because as soon as you see that piece of malware and you see an IP address in there, it's like, oh, I can just disable that by blocking that IP address. And so there are these really crazy DNS rendezvous points. So like these, the, this way of generating like thousands of DNS names and then the malware is just going to sample like each one to try and get access. So that makes the DNS blocking harder. But, uh, but then the, the adversary has to do something a little more clever than just get a new EC2 instance. The adversary is having to do uh, some programming, which is, yeah, a little bit uh, harder for it, for hopefully, for them to do. Um, another thing that you could do is start restricting behaviors. So connections, file and, and registry activity. If uh, the adversary comes into some behaviors that they had depended upon working and it didn't work, this gets at the kill chain. They have to figure out a different way uh, of changing the process. Uh, all the adversaries, the, 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 basically the defenders and the attackers, we rely on tools. Like if we don't have our tools, like we have to manually create the tool to, to do the automation. And so if you can knock out the most popular tools, like Metasploit or Mimikatz, if you can knock out the class of tools, then you're, you're at an advantage. And then the last one is if you can prevent the entire box, then you totally win, right? Like that, that, wrecks, the, that wrecks the playbook. Uh, all the play, plays that go through that box are now wrecked. And then you, hopefully the, it's wrecked for good so that you can basically get rid of it in the matrix. So you can focus on the other one, 
Uh, and I'm, I'm imagining this framework is going to get to a point where they're going to deprecate certain boxes uh, just because we have eliminated the technique as being viable. Okay, so here's an example of why you would want to focus your controls at the top of the pyramid. And this is a credential dumping example from the uh, CISO perspective. Uh, and so this is looking at just the difference between going after a tool versus going after the whole uh, box. Uh, so the, the thing it's trying to address is credential dumping. So when you are trying to authenticate someone on a system, what you'll do is you'll bring up all the credentials into memory. Uh, and then the login process is going to be like checking against the credentials in memory. So these tools, the adversary tools, the dumping tools, will just scan memory. And uh, if it knows how memory is laid out, you can just see those passwords in, in the clear in memory. Uh, so this is what Mimikatz did very effectively. And this was the de facto tool for years for people to, when they got onto a Windows machine, you would send Mimikatz as a Metasploit module, and then you would get a bunch of credentials uh, back from that, that target system. Um, and so what you could do is you could run a monitor that looks for Mimikatz and then make sure it never executes, right? So you can attack it at the tool level. Um, but the problem is, is that you could actually do multiple implementations of this that are not Mimikatz. So here's a list of them, like PW dump, GSF dump, or you could build your own custom one. And if you have just been looking for the specific password dumping tool, then you don't win, right? That box is not eliminated. But if you look at the underlying thing that it depends upon, basically these credentials are in the clear in memory, then what you can do is you could basically disable all the caching, right? Like that thing should never cache credentials. It should always decrypt them and then come back and then and then do whatever it needs to do to process them. It should never be in the clear in memory. And then this will get rid of that whole box, uh, is the idea. OK. Uh, so the last thing is, say I have de deployed all these tools, I need to figure out if they're working. And so this, all, everything up until this point is knowing the enemy. So now you have to know yourself. That's the other part of the, of the Sun Tzu uh, quote. And so how can you tell if a control is working? <laughs> like, I buy all this software, I spent a million dollars, or half a billion dollars on that box that told me that Equifax is, uh, is sure is not gonna uh, give up the credit cards. So how do you identify that that thing is working? So this is where a whole bunch of companies doing automated attack validation are coming in. So uh, Attack IQ, uh, MITRE's got this Caldera tool, uh, Canary's got this red team automation tool. Uh, and these tools are targeting uh, your stacks to see whether or not those TTPs are actually getting detected and prevented. And so uh, this is the way you can do an inventory on your, your back end and, and the inventory on the controls that are protecting the back end to see whether or not everything is working. So that's the, the final piece of this. Um, um, and then I'm going to end here because one of the things that they have found is that this is mostly being used. If you go through the attack framework and you click on all, any of those techniques, they're almost all enterprise security things. And so they are working on a cloud version of the framework. Uh, and I think there's another link that might have a cloud uh, navigator. That would be the thing that, that uh, um, they're working on next. So that is a sort of the all I have for this course. Are there any questions about MITRE attack and all right, so I guess I'll just so next class is just a work a work class. I'll be here helping people debug. Um, otherwise, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for a good quarter. <laughs>